Oh, through the week, though, I noticed something. I don't know if you have. It looks like it's an oak tree that I'm thinking about. I've seen a few of them. In fact, we've got one right here on our campus. In fact, there are three oak trees against the parking lot. And uh, the one in the middle is kind of odd because it's covered with brown leaves. Now, it's just nearly spring and brown leaves. Now, you know, if you know anything about agriculture and nature, those leaves have died. They died somewhere back in late fall or somewhere during the winter. They died whenever that life that was being sourced from the tree was no longer sourced from the tree. They died. But here, months later, they're still hanging on. Brown leaves. I want you to have that in your mind's eye as we look at the message this morning because Here the Apostle Paul is talking about putting off the old and putting on the new. And the old that he's talking about is that which continues, seemingly so, to hang on. Though you become a new you, you have hanging on old attitudes, old perspectives, old wounds. Matters like unforgiveness and bitterness and unlove. And here the Apostle Paul said, okay, that's not you. It was you, but that is no longer you. So let that go. Turn it loose. And put on that which is the expressions of life. This new life that you have received. Now with that kind of in the background of our thinking, let's look at it. It's found there in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 and verses 22 and 24. There the Apostle begins. Now, I say and testify in the Lord, that is, this is God's word, From the Lord himself coming through my heart, I testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. Now notice, he doesn't say this is a suggestion, something that you should take as a matter of consideration. No, this is what must happen. What? You must no longer walk as the Gentiles. Uh, The word Gentile, that's just a word that Paul would use to describe all who are lost. Those who are in the world without God. He says, you, those who know God, those of you who are part of the family, those of you who have been born of God, you must not, you must not continue to walk as the, no longer, he says, walk as the Gentiles. And the word walk, what's, what's the meaning? Well, it means, you, you know, you, you, you must no longer live would be a good word. Um, no, no longer live, no longer think like a Gentile. No longer feel like a Gentile. No, no longer operate the way the Gentile operates. No longer behave. No, you must no longer walk as those who are lost. Um, he goes on to say that those who are in the world without God operate in the futility of their minds. Futility. Uh, the idea is emptiness. Uh, that which is their way of life leads to that which is empty, futile, vanity, no sense to it at all. So he says, put that off. And you see how he reiterates it in that very next phrase. He says, put off the old mankind. Your translation might have put off the old self or the old man. The Greek word is the word that is, should be translated man, right? But I think for our understanding, it helps us to say, rather than put off the old man, put off the old mankind. Because when it says put off the old man, the man that he's talking about here is the man who is Adam. Really important that you hear what I just said. When he says put off the old man, he's saying put off the old man, Adam, and all that pertains to Adam. Now, if you've been with me here at Colonial Hills for any length of time, you've heard me say this numerous times, but let's just reiterate it. The Bible teaches that on the planet today, there are two men, the man, Adam, and the man, Christ, too. And you are either in Adam or you are in Christ. If you've been born again, you're in Christ, right? If you've been born only once, you're in Adam. That's why Jesus said you must be born again. So in one of those, and here, Paul is addressing those who've been born again. They are in the man, Christ Jesus. 
And he's saying, since that's the truth about you, you need to put off that which is the old man, the old mankind, and all that pertains to the old man, Adam. Because that's not who you are anymore. Put that off. It's like those leaves that are hanging on. Notice he goes on to describe the old mankind as that which is corrupt through deceitful desires. Corrupt. You know what corruption is, right? It's that which begins the moment death takes place. At that moment, corruption begins. And it's a kind of downward spiral, an ever downward digressive spiral. And you think about that which was man's original sin. What was, what was that the result of? Deceit, desire, wanting that which was the lie duped into believing that the lie would provide that which the lie could never produce, deceived. And that's the way it is in the world. As mankind, dead in trespasses and sin, continue to seek after that which is the lie, believing that in the lie they will find meaning and fulfilling and fulfillment and significance and hope and value. So, Paul says, that's not you guys. Something's happened. You're not who you used to be. You really are not who you used to be. And I know some of you think, now wait a minute. I really am who I've always been. I mean, let's just get real. I know what you're saying, but you know, that's just... No, no, you actually... The day you trusted Jesus, you were actually included in his cross. So that there at the cross, you actually died. The old you died. Crucified together with Christ. That actually happened. And on that day when you believed in the Lord Jesus, you were included in his resurrection. So when he walked out of the tomb three days after his death... You, in Christ, walked out with him alive with that life that is resurrected God life. That's the new you. That really did happen. And I know the reason that we think, well, that's not, it doesn't look like it happened. It doesn't feel like it happened. Well, it's like the, the leaves on that tree. Um, we, we've been taught to go with our feelings. We've been taught to to, to operate on the basis of that which we can see and put our hands on. But remember early on, I mean, the Lord Jesus taught us that we are those who live by faith, not by sight. And he could have gone ahead to say, and you don't live by your feelings ever either. It's not what you feel. It's not what you see. The truth is the truth. And you must operate according to the truth. And this is the truth. This really did happen. In Christ, you died to Adam and to all that pertains to Adam. And what Paul is saying here is, now believe that to be true and embrace that reality and begin to live like it's true. When he says put off the old man, it's because the old man has already been put off. You see what I'm saying? Put it off, why? Because you died to Adam. Now live like that's true, practically speaking. Put off the old mankind. And then, the positive, he says, put on the new mankind. Do you see that? He says, be renewed in the spirit of your minds. It reminds me of Romans chapter 12. Remember the apostle Paul says, I beg you. In light of what has happened, in light of all that God has done in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus, the giving of the Holy Spirit, I beg you, I plead with you that you stop being conformed to the way of this world. And if you go to the original language, he's, he's literally saying... Stop doing that because that's what you're doing. You're letting the world dictate to you how to live. You're, you're looking to the world for your cues and for your clues. And you need to stop doing that. Why? Because you're no more of this world than I'm of this world, said Jesus. You're of another realm. You really are the people of God. Heaven really is your home. That is the way it really is. So stop letting the world tell you how to live. And then he says, and be transformed how? By the renewing of your mind. You see, guys, putting on the new man, first of all, is a miraculous, supernatural work of God. He does it. But then it's to us to believe it and begin to operate as if it's true. It's a matter of faith. We believe it. 
which means we begin to order our lives accordingly. And we give ourselves to that which is the work of God, the renewing of the mind, so that we begin to think differently. And guys, listen, thinking changes everything, the way you think. I don't know if this will help you or not, but I, I talk to myself all the time, okay? And, and I want to encourage you to talk to yourself. And I talk out loud. I talk a lot like I'm talking right now. I need to kind of hide when I do this. That's why you'll find me in the truck riding around. I can't even do this at the office, you know, because the people hear me, they're disturbed if they hear me like that. They think I'm disturbed, but, but I'm talking to myself. And, and please hear me, anytime I preach and I'm pointing this way, I've got three pointing back at me. I, I walk through this. I, I talk through this. I tell people I talk to myself because I love good, stimulating conversation. <laughs> I, I, like to, I like to talk to someone who agrees with me. See, so, so, but no, really, what I'm saying is that I think it's important for us to, to vocalize what's going on between our ears. And I think if you would speak out some of the things that you're thinking over and over and over again, it would shock you what you're thinking about routinely. To hear yourself say that. Come out of your mouth. Hear what I'm saying? And, and I don't know if this helps you, but I even... I, I go through kind of visible physical exercises like when, when it says put off the old man, I, I will say, okay, now, I, I understand that in Christ I have been crucified and the old man has been taken off of me. I'm no longer a part of Adam's race. Now think about what that means. That domain of darkness and death and corruption and deceit. Believing the lie, the result is empty. It's not me. And I've... I've I have been made brand new, the, the new man put on me, the person of Jesus himself, the one who's ultimate reality, the one who's the creator of heaven and earth, the unbegun beginning of everything, the one who explains life. Remember, the Bible says he was in the beginning with God and was God. In him was life, the kind of life that is God life, unbegun, unending life. And that life was the light of men. That is alive with his life. Life begins to make sense. I see it. This is what life was meant to be. This is reality. This is the truth. And what is this life? That, well, the Bible tells us this life, which is God life, is love. I've been made alive with life. That is love. Unbegun life. Unending love. Almighty love. That's who I am. See, and I see myself putting it on. So, what I'm thinking is put aside, put away every thought that is unlove. When I look at a person, and I have that old habit of deciding and judging that person based on creed or culture or the way they're dressed, I, I put aside, that's a lie. That's the way the world operates. The truth is God loves that person. Forget the fact he just cut me off in traffic. Forget that. <laughs> Forget he was a knucklehead when he ordered his sandwich and they got it wrong and acted like an idiot. And just, God loves him so much that he gave his life for him. And I've been made alive with that love so that in this moment I might love him, representing that love in this moment. See how that works? You see what I'm talking about? We, we have this idea that Jesus died just to get me out of hell. No, he died to take away my sins so that having done that, he might give me his life that I in this earth might live that life that is his life where I am. Paul says, put on the new man. Be who you are. In word and in deed, how you think about other people. What you say about other people, listen, and not just those words that come out of your mouth, but those words that never, ever, see, maybe you're able to hold your mouth so that you don't say it out loud, but it's just back and forth in between your ears. And you're saying things that are not true. You're saying that which is a lie. You're operating as if you're still lost and you're not. You're operating as if you're in the world without God, you're not. Put on the new mankind. 
Let, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Remember, let this mind be in you. Watch out. The Bible teaches today you got saved. You received the mind of Christ. So that if you're a born again believer right now, you have the mind of Christ right now in you. So why does the Bible say, let this mind be in you? Let it be what it is in you. Embrace it. Live like it's true. Why would you operate with the mind of Adam when you have the mind of Christ? You see what I'm saying? That's what this text is about. It says, put off of that, put off that which is of Adam, all that pertains to Adam, put on that which is Christ. So you see what's happening. In Christ you died, in Christ you were buried, in Christ you were raised to newness of life, alive, newness of life, alive with the life of Christ himself, so that he in you might express his life through you on the planet. You his ambassador representing him where you work, where you play, in your family, wherever you go, Christ in you, your life. Right? <laughs> now, What's the chance of that ever being your practical experience? I mean, really. I know some of you are thinking, that, well, well, to be as Christ, yeah. And to settle for nothing less. What's the hope? That that'll ever be true of you, practically speaking. That you walk into the room, and when you walk into the room and you speak, it says Christ himself, and there's a reality about it. And people experience him in you. What's, what's, the, chance, what's the hope of that? Well, Paul answers that question. I'm glad you asked. He says the hope is Christ himself in you. I want you to hear that. If he said, guys, go do this and you're on your own, that'd be, that'd be too much to ask. You, you can't ask a man who is alive to Adam alive to that which is the domain of Adam, to not behave and operate and think as one who's of Adam. It's not, that's too much. And by the way, that's the reason the law was given, was to demonstrate that's too much. But one who's born of God, who's really a child of the king, who has God's DNA, who's one of his children, one who has been joined to him in a living union, one with him in spirit, well, now, see, you're not in this by yourself. This is not something you're going to do for him. This is something he's going to do. Now, listen, when Paul writes this, he's addressing you guys, us guys, we folk. In fact, the, the, in the original language, it's a plural, the you. You do this. And he's addressing us, all of us who believe. But now listen, and it's important that you hear this. When you read your Bible, it's important that you hear this. When he addresses us guys who are in Christ, understand us guys in Christ are those in whom Christ is. Now make sure you hear what I just said. Matthew, you do this. Who are you? You are Christ in you. That's who you are. And he in you is your potential. We learned that last week. We talked about stewardship and the, 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 the master giving in, investing all of, his, all of his potential into those who would receive, right? So, Lisa, put, on, put off the old and put on the new. You, Lisa, you do that. Who are you? You are Christ in you. He's your potential. You put on mercy and grace. Why? Because Christ is your hope. Hope is not wishful thinking. You know, the world doesn't have a, a word like we have. When we have the word hope, the world's word hope doesn't mean what our word hope means. In, in the world today, excuse me, in the world today, what does hope mean? It means, um, well, it's not a chance. It's going to happen. There's no way. It's not even a, a little improbable. It's, it, it's not going to happen. Well, all we can do now is, is hope. It means we got nothing. I said, well, all we can do is hope. That's not this word. When the Bible says Christ in you is the hope, it's Christ in you is the certainty, is the guarantee, is the confidence that it will happen. What? The glory of God. What's the glory of God? The goodness of God. What? Christ in you is the confidence you have that the goodness of God will be demonstrated in you and through you. Did you hear what I just said? Thank God he doesn't say, your hope is in you, operating by yourself, apart from God. 
I'd say, well, that's well, all we can do with that is, well, we can, we can hope. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Right? But what's the hope? What's the confidence? What's the assurance? This is, I know this. Why? Because God said so. See, the Bible teaches that the day you got saved, he came to take up residence in you to accomplish that which is his ultimate purpose, and that is to conform you to the image of his son. And he's at work doing it right now. I want you to see it in case you didn't believe it. Second Corinthians, the Bible says, and we all, those of us who know Christ, who with unveiled faces, now we've seen the truth, it's been revealed to us, and we can't unsee what we've seen. Jesus is Lord of all. And in him I've been crucified and I've been buried and been raised to newness of life. He lives in me. And we contemplate the Lord's glory. We contemplate his goodness. Oh, he's a good God. He's a mighty God. He's an unstoppable God. He's glorious. And as we, alive with his life, with unveiled faces, seeing the truth, and we can't unsee what we've seen, and we contemplate his glory, even now we are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory where you sit right now in this moment. The God who is in you is working in you and bringing about all things to this end. And at this moment, you are being conformed to the image of God. Wow. Remember, Jesus said, I will not leave you alone. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. I will pray and the Father will send the Holy Spirit, one like me. He goes on to explain the Holy Spirit is none other than the person and presence of himself coming to live in them. And he says, and the Spirit, speaking of himself, living in them, he said, he will guide you into all truth. You go back to the original language, it's a picture of one who's cutting through uncharted territory, going places that no one's ever been. He's leading us into all, tr- all not some of it, but all truth. And that's what times like this is about, but please hear me, it takes place in the mundane, everyday matters of life, when you're driving down the road or talking to your kids, Christ in you is working things together to bring about this transformation of you being conformed to the image of the Son of God. How many of you understand that God never builds a road that goes nowhere? He always finishes what he starts. And this is his promise. He's going to finish what he started in you. Before the foundation of the world, Christ crucified to this end. Not just to get you out of heaven into heaven. And not just to get Christ out of heaven into you. But that you, alive with the life of Christ, might be conformed to the image of God's Son. (laughs) For the glory of God for all of eternity. And God says, I'm going to do that, guys. It's not just I'm going to do it, I'm doing it right now. Even when you're unaware of it, I'm working in you. To bring about my purpose in your life. Isn't it glorious to kind of get in on in terms of your understanding of what he's really doing? You can kind of anticipate it, enjoy it along the way. Thank you, God. And when you see it, it changes everything. When you're in one of those situations where it looks dark and dreary and there's no light anywhere, you have a hope. Even then, you have a confidence, you have assurance that God in this moment is at work. Bringing about that ultimate purpose, conform to the image of Christ. So Paul says, embrace it. How? Put off that which was and put on that which is. And notice, the indication of 1 Peter is that there will be people in the world that will see the difference. <laughs> That's why he says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who might ask the reason for the hope that's in you. What is that? What's the implication? People will see there's something different about you. What is, what is it about you? I, what? what, what? That, that's what this verse is about. Because they see that when trouble comes your way, you have a different perspective. You have a different response. You have a different attitude in that moment. And the way you operate is different than the regular guy. You, you have hope. Even now. And some of you have been through the hardest times. I I hear some of your stories and I think I can't believe you've had to go through this. You you have heartache like no one knows. You have no one to talk to about it. Yeah, you do. And I'm just saying this to you. Yeah, you do. And he's more real than any other person in this room or any one other person on the planet. And he's with you and he's in you in every moment of every day. And he hears your heart cry. And he says, I want you to know that I'm working in this moment. 
to bring about my glory, which is Christ in you, conformed to his image. That's glorious good news. So I see myself like the, I, I see myself like the little boy. You know, I, I'm standing outside the toy store. I'm not quite tall enough to, to see over the bottom edge of the pane of glass looking into the toy store. So I'm standing on tiptoe, peeking in to see what's in there. That's, that's First Peter. I stand on tiptoe in hope and confidence and assurance. And people see it in my eyes. That's the idea. I live with, oh, I know what you see. I see what you see, but I, do you see what I see? Do you see that? My God is working in my life. There's healing in his rays, and I'm bathing in them. People are going to ask about that. What's wrong with you? <laughs> What's going on? For I'm confident, says Paul first, excuse me, Philippians chapter 4, I'm confident this very thing that he who began a good work, what is the good work? That he began, Christ in you, the hope of glory, Christ, the Son of God, that you might be conformed to him. That's the work that he began. He who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. God said, I'm going to do that. But now watch this. That doesn't mean that you just sit there and wait for, to, you know, to, you're just going to get zapped. I think sometimes we have this idea that men like Paul were, I don't know, magic. You know, like Paul just one day just zap. And with that zap, he got it all. No. Paul, like you, a man, unveiled face, saw the truth, revealed to him. God began to work. And he continued to do that work so that Paul would be able to say, you know something I've learned? I've learned the secret of life. What's the implication? I didn't know it for a long time. God showed it to me. God revealed it. I've seen it. I can't not, I can't unseen what, I can't unsee what I've seen. So that I know how to handle whatever comes my way. I don't care if it's a bad marriage or if it's a bad job or it's a, I don't care. I know what it takes and I have what it takes. I have who it takes to handle whatever comes my way. Christ in me. Christ my strength. I see it, says Paul. He learned that. We're learning that, right? And it's okay to say we're learning it. This is a process. But God is at work in every moment of every day. And Paul says, I am confident he's going to finish what he started. You can live with that assurance in order to be true. So says the Apostle Paul in Philippians 2. He says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It is your salvation to work out. Unique to you. In the sense that God knows exactly what you're dealing with. He knows exactly where you're coming from. And his grace in the moment is more than enough. And to say his grace is more than enough is to say the Christ who is in you is your answer. And you're learning that to be true. Paul says, work it out. Work out the implications and the applications of it. Work it out, work it out, work it out. You've heard that pretty is only skin deep. But ugly goes all the way to the bone. <laughs> yeah. Well, work it out is that ugly that goes all the way to the bone. You, you hear what I'm saying? Put that off. That is not you. Well, but what? it's their fault. You need to own it and say, that is the way I dealt with it. That's the way I chose to operate. That's the way I've chosen to think. And I'm choosing to believe the truth and put that off. The answer is not for other people to get fixed. The answer is not for someone else to do it right. Jesus is my answer. And I put off all of that that's ugly. We're going to talk about that which is the foundation, the basis of it all. And you look at it from the negative, from the positive. If you look at it from the positive, it is put on love. Right? Which, which, which listen guys, to put on love is, is, to, is to be a self for others kind of person. That's reality, that's ultimate truth. Adam is a self for self kind of person. Self for self. Christ is self for others kind of person. That's who our God is. You get to the tip of the top of that which is our eternal God, and that's who he is. He is a self for others. He demonstrated that at the cross. Now he called you to be a self for others. So put it on. 
Which means it's not just how I treat people. It's how I think about them. What I say about them in between my ears and what I say to them when I speak out loud. I seek their highest good. I love them. I'm here for them. That's the meaning of life. That's reality. That's truth. Right? Put on love. Take it from the negative perspective and it's put off unforgiveness. Listen carefully. When Jesus died on the cross, he who knew no sin was made sin for us, the Bible says. He bore in his body the sin of us all so that he might provide the forgiveness of sin. The Bible says God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not counting men's sins against them, not counting your sin, not counting my sin against us. That's what he was doing at the cross. Why? Because that's his love for us. He forgave. For me to receive that forgiveness and then to deny others' forgiveness, in other words, to operate in unforgiveness, is to deny the God of eternity. Please hear what I'm saying. I, I, I say this, I say this with, I, I'm not saying that your, your heart is into it. You, I'm saying you're thinking wrong if you say that you can be unforgiving and not say no to the God of, you're, you're saying no to him. You're saying, I don't believe you. I don't agree with you. You are wrong. But he's not. Please hear me. He is the truth and he wants it for you. We said it last week and we're going to close with this. Remember what Jesus said regarding his death? He was explaining the reason of his death. He said, you know, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, the result is it bears much fruit, a harvest that can cover the earth. You have a seed, what do you do with it? You can put it on a shelf. You put it on a shelf, it will remain alone. But if it falls into the earth and dies, it reproduces itself. Jesus said, I am that grain of wheat. You know that Jesus could have lived and remained alone? Because he was without sin, death had no hold on him. Jesus did not have to die. He chose to die. Why? For what I've been talking about this morning, that he might reproduce those who are exactly like him on the earth. And who is he? He's eternal truth. That's who he's made you just like you. Love, positive, put it on. Unforgiveness, put it off. Father in heaven, thank you. Your incredible provision of salvation, I've thought for so many years that it was just about me getting to heaven and that's all I was interested in. <laughs> But seeing what I see, I can't not see it. I can't unsee what I've seen. And I see that it's so much more than just having sins forgiven and having a ticket into heaven. It's so much more. It's about being alive with your life, joined to you and reproducing you in this world, representing you as your ambassadors. That men, women, boys, and girls throughout the earth might hear and receive, believe, and be made alive. The glory of God. Good. Goodness. Love, mercy. Wow. You're a great God. With eyes closed, heads bowed. Did you hear something this morning that you've not heard before? Maybe the voice of the Lord Jesus in your heart of hearts calling you to himself. The Bible says no one comes except that the Lord himself by his spirit calls you. He calls you to himself. And maybe today he's calling you. Maybe you've heard him in the depth of your heart. He's awakened you to his eternal reality. And you've, you, you, you hear him and, and he's asking you to receive what he offers. He wants it for you. He wants you to know his love and to live in that love. You need but answer yes, Lord. I receive. Confessing with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Believe in your heart that God's raised him from the dead. Believing that he is God's provision. The Bible teaches that you are born of his spirit. You're made alive. You're saved. You're rescued from Adam's race. You've been made alive with the life of Christ. Now, maybe this morning you've heard God's voice, the spirit of Christ in you. Put off that old way of thinking. Stop thinking that way. 
I offer you something that's beyond your wildest imagination. Believe me. Believe the truth. Let me show you that which is ultimate reality day by day, moment by moment, step by step. Put off that old way and put on the new. Be who you really are. You need only say yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Healing is taking place right now. Scars of bitterness and anger and hatred falling away. Thank you, God. <laughs> People stepping into the light and the warmth of your healing rays. Basking in what has always been there, but now real in this moment. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You are Lord of all. There's nothing you can't stop. There's not one person here that's a project that's beyond you. <laughs> not a soul. Thank you, God. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray.